Yerushalayim as we recite the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Avaed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'chol levavcha u'v'chol nafshecha u'v'chol meodecha ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'chol levavcha u'v'chol nafshecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, or actually please be seated, but first you have to turn around. And you know, I just want to mention being, you know, what Father's Day tomorrow? The greatest thing about being a father is being a father is having a little boy like, yeah, that's the best part about being a father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Ya'amod chava bat Yisrael. Baruch atah. Adonai Eloheinu melech alam, asher b'char b'nvim tovim v'ratzave divrehem aneimarim be'emet. Baruch atah Adonai habacher b'torah Uve Moshe Avdo, Uve Yisrael Amo, Uve Mvie Ha'emet Vatzedech. Blessed is the Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Blessed is the Lord for the revelation of Torah, for Moses his servant, and Yisrael his people and for the prophets of truth and righteousness. This morning's scripture is from Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Jehuda, Yehuda in Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and settle many disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Al ha-Torah, ve'al ha-avodah, ve'al ha-navim, ve'al yom ha-shabbat ha-zeh, shenatata lanu adonai eloheinu, Likdushav limnucha, lichavod ultifaret, al hakol, adonai eloheinu, anak nu modim lak, umavarachim otak, yiparak shim kaba fi kochai, tamid leolam vaed, boruchat adonai, mekate shashabat. For the Torah and for the privilege of worship 
for the prophets and for this Shabbat that you, O Lord our God, have given us for holiness and rest, for honor and glory. We thank and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Blessed is the Lord for the Shabbat and its holiness. Amen. So as you know, we've been working our way through the book of Acts, and uh, this morning we're in chapter 17, so let's just go ahead and jump right on in. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apoll Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Yeshua I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Now, the reason I'm focusing in on this passage of Scripture is because it's part of a pattern. We see this pattern throughout the book of Acts. When Paul starts on his missionary journeys, this is the pattern. Wherever he goes, he goes to the synagogue first. He shares with them the message that Yeshua is the Messiah. Some listen and agree. Some don't. Usually a bunch of Gentiles do and some of the Jews. And then the Jews who are left get upset with Paul, <laughs> takes him out of town, and he goes to the next synagogue. This is the pattern. If you've got your notes with you, you want to fill these out. Number one, Saul travels to a new city. Number two, he teaches at the local synagogue about Yeshua. Number three, some Jews believe and many Gentiles believe. And then number four, some oppose Paul and his companions, often violently. This is repeated over and over and over throughout the book of Acts. So it raises an important question, which I addressed in my email blast last night, if you've gotten it yet. Why does Paul go to the synagogues first. You realize that he is specifically called the apostle to the Gentiles. More than once. And yet, every city he goes to, he goes to the Jewish people first. And in fact, we call him Paul. His name's Saul. I'm thinking he took on the name Paul so he could be more Gentile friendly. This was his world. This was his ministry. And yet, everywhere he goes, he goes to the synagogues first. Him being called the apostle to the Gentiles, 1 Timothy 2 would be one example. Here's, where it Here's what it says. There's one God and one mediator between man and God, the man, Messiah Yeshua. He gave himself to ransom everyone. That's why I was appointed as the herald and the apostle to the Gentiles. In every city, he stops at the synagogue first. In fact, if there is no synagogue, he goes looking for where the minion is or where the Jewish people hang out. He always goes to the Jewish people first. In the book of Romans, in the very first chapter, he's writing to the Roman congregation, and this is what he says. I'm not ashamed of the good news of the Messiah. For it is the power of God to salvation for anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. It's important to know that God's not done with Israel. The Jewish people are still God's chosen people. God still loves Israel and God still loves Jewish people. You come to a Messianic synagogue, so chances are you already believe that. You take that for granted. But most of the people out there that call themselves the church, they don't take that for granted. They don't believe that. They think that the Jewish people rejected Jesus, so God rejected the Jewish people and replaced them with what's called the church. That is the typical Christian teaching that's out there. But that is not what the Bible teaches. So what I want to share with you is what I believe the Bible teaches on this topic. Paul wrote, and I quote again from Romans, I say then... Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. 
So how is it when a passage of Scripture so plainly says that God is not done with the Jewish people, that the majority of that which calls itself the church says he is? How? I can only come up with one explanation, anti-Semitism. I can't think of another because the Bible is pretty straightforward on this topic. So what is the compelling reason that people have to say God's done with the Jewish people? God made an everlasting covenant with Israel. It's repeated frequently throughout the Old Testament. Let me give you an example of one of the places it's referenced. Jeremiah 31. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, the sun, the stars, the waves by the sea, only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below searched out will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. So in Romans, God says, through Paul, he has not cast away his people. Paul says, I'm Jewish. In Jeremiah, as one of the many passages, God says, no matter what the children of Israel do, they'll never be cast off permanently as my people. It doesn't get any clearer than that. It's one of the clearest teachings in Scripture. And yet, the majority of the people that call themselves the church say the Jewish people rejected Jesus, so God rejected the Jewish people. Yet the Scripture says God has not rejected the Jewish people. Jews are still God's chosen people. God has a plan to save the world, and Israel is at the center of that plan. Now, when I talk to you about Israel, I'm not usually talking about the nation on the Mediterranean Sea near the Jordan River. That is also called Israel. It is Israel. But Israel, more often than not, refers to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a synonym today in the Bible for Jewish people. There are times in history when the Jewish people didn't live in the land called Israel, but they were still Israel. So as we read through the scriptures and I talk about Israel, yes, think about the nation that's over there on the Mediterranean near the Jordan River, but think about the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom we call Jews. Here's what Romans says about the Jewish people. They're the people of Israel. They have been adopted as God's children. God's glory belongs to them. So do the covenants. They received the Torah from God, the law of God. They were taught to worship in the temple. They were given the promises. The founders of our nation belong to them. Messiah comes from their family line. He is God over all. May he always be praised. Amen. So it's not like God once dealt with the Jewish people, got frustrated with them, and decided to give them up and work with everybody but Jews. That's not the case at all. Even the book of Romans in the New Testament clearly points out, as does Acts, which we'll be looking at some more, that God is still working with, through, by, for, and because of the Jewish people. What happened... There were 2,000 years of dispersion. And the people who didn't know the Bible well or didn't trust what it said assumed that since the Jewish people were under God's judgment, that God must be done with them. But they didn't read the scriptures. God said he would regather them back. There were some people who would actually teach lessons from the pulpit that one day Israel would become a nation again and others would mock them because we're talking 2,000 years. And yet it happened because they trusted the scripture. God chose Israel to bring the Messiah to the world. Yet Israel stumbled in faith. The very Messiah we longed for, most of our people did not accept. But now it's the world's responsibility to bring the Messiah 
back to the Jewish people. It would be something like this. Let's say you're unemployed for a month, and my family feeds you every day for a month. And then I become unemployed. What are you going to do? Nothing. Or are you going to feed me? We brought the Messiah to the world. Don't you think it's only fair that the world brings the Messiah back? We lost him. Bring him back. I, I, I like to use this diagram, and we'll reference it again in a few moments. I told you that God has a plan to save the world, and Israel is at the center of that plan. Okay, so this is a wheel. This is the salvation cycle. And it is a cycle. At the top, we've got Israel. God chose the Jewish people, he trained them, he gave them the scriptures, and the Messiah came through them. When the Jewish people are walking with the Lord, it's all good. And God told the Jewish people to bring the gospel to the world. Even the gospel, even the apostle to the Gentiles was a Jew. He was responsible for bringing the gospel to the world. And did he do a great job? He did an amazing job. The entire Roman world was converted. It was amazing what Paul did. And yet, many of our people stumbled in faith. We kind of went downhill. And we kind of lived in rebellion. And we lost the Messiah. But now, there's so many people who believe in Yeshua. What's their mission? Their mission is to bring the message back to the Jewish people. This part worked. This part worked. This part worked. What happened to this part? This part's not working. The wheel is broken. It's like flat on one side. And the vehicle's not moving very fast. Again, Romans. Again, here's what I ask. They didn't trip or stumble and fall once and for all time, did they? They didn't fall to never get up. No, not at all. Because Israel sinned, those who aren't Jews can be saved. And that'll make them jealous. Israel's sin brought riches to the world. Their loss brought riches to the non-Jews. What greater riches will come when all Israel turns to God? How did Israel's fall result in the blessing of the world? Well, when Paul brought the message to Jews, some accepted it, many rejected it. He'd give it to them, give it to them. And then when he was done teaching, then he'd go out to the Gentiles. That never happened before this. It was just kind of ethnocentric. There were some that went out, but they didn't have the gospel. It was before Yeshua. But from Yeshua, he's, he's the way to life. And so they brought the message to the Gentile world as a result or consequence of the Jewish people refusing to accept it. It's kind of like that parable that uh, Yeshua tells. He says, imagine a great feast. It's a wedding. Let's call it for now a wedding banquet. And everybody you invited doesn't come. They make excuses. Oh, man, I just bought a new horse. I got to break it. Oh, I just got married. Oh, I just brought a, bought a house, and I got to go check the plumbing. They make excuses. And the, there's the party, and nobody shows up. So you tell the party planner, just go invite people. We got all this food. Just invite anybody. Go out to the highways and byways and invite people to come in so the house isn't empty and we can have a feast. So they go out to the highways and byways and just start bringing in everybody. That's the idea. Those who were invited chose not to come, so the door was open to everybody. Verse 13, I'm talking to you who are not Jews. I am the apostle to the non-Jews. So here's Paul, again calling himself the apostle to the Gentiles. I hope somehow to stir up my people to want to have what you have. Perhaps I can save some of them. When they were not accepted, it became possible for the whole world to be brought back to God. So what will happen when they are accepted? It will be like life from the dead. The idea is, if the Jewish people stumbled in their faith, and the end result was the world getting saved, if something so bad as God's chosen people losing faith for a time results in something so good, 
Imagine what will result from them coming back to the Lord. Wow. What's left to be good? This is the best. There is something left. It's the whole millennial kingdom and Messiah reigning from his throne and the wolf dwelling with the lamb and no more war. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. That's what's left. And it seems to me that we're the ones keeping it from happening. How does it happen? When this happens. But we're not doing this. If we bring the message back to God's own people, Messiah will return. Perhaps. It's one way of looking at it. Scripture talks about an olive tree. And it talks about natural branches and wild olive branches that were grafted into the tree. Now, why would you do that? If you have a cultivated olive tree, would you graft in wild branches? Wouldn't that mess up your tree? But if you love the branches, you might want to graft them in for their sake, right? If the Jews do not persist in their unbelief, they will be grafted in again because God's able to graft them in. After all, if you non-Jews were cut off from what is naturally a wild olive tree, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much easier will it be for these natural branches to be grafted back into their own olive tree? I don't want you to be ignorant of this secret, brothers. A partial hardening has come on Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it's written. Those three things are worth remembering, highlighting, taking notes on. It says, one, a partial hardening has happened to Israel. This idea that God has done with the Jewish people is not true, never has been true. It's a partial hardening. For goodness sake, the apostle to the Gentiles was a Jew. Some of my best friends happen to be Jews. We got a bunch of them in this room who believe in Yeshua. It's not a full hardening. It's a partial hardening. That's the first thing that you need to know. Second thing you need to know, it's temporary. God says, until the full number of the Gentiles come in. That word, until. It's a partial hardening, and it's temporary. Until the full number of the Gentiles come in. So this part isn't done yet, either. And thirdly, and this is the whopper, all Israel will be saved. There's a lot of confusion over that. Some people mistakenly think it means that all Jewish people who ever lived will automatically get saved. Well, that's, it can't mean that. Yeshua talked about people of unbelief who would die in their sins, be lost forever. So then what could it possibly mean, Steve? Well, I think when Messiah returns, the Jewish community that's left will be the remnant, and all of them will come to faith. That's what I think it means. It must refer to the Jews alive at the time of the fulfillment of Messiah's return. It can't refer to Jews of all times because many have died in unbelief and rebellion. All right, so Acts 17 that I introduced to you a few minutes ago kind of introduces us to God's plan for saving the world. I drew it here for you, but it looks kind of better up there. Jewish people walk with God, bring the message of God to the world. However, the Jews stumble in their faith and salvation comes to the Gentiles and then the Gentiles walk with God. Gentiles are now responsible to bring the Jews the message of God once again. Comes full cycle, the salvation cycle. Started, and for, for your notes, it started with the Jews. They brought the Bible and the Messiah to the world. Jewish people stumbled in their faith. They primarily rejected Messiah. That opened the doors, number three, for bringing the Messiah to the rest of the world. Number four, it's now the world's duty to bring the Messiah back to the Jewish people. Number five, Israel's partial hardening of heart will end, and all Israel will be saved. And number six, the results will be tremendous. Let's look at that one more time. Romans 11:12. 12. Now, if their stumbling means riches for the world... And if their fall means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full participation mean? Verse 15, for if their rejection results in reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance bring but life 
from the dead. One of the most often quoted Bible verses by Bible-believing people is John 3.16. But with this context, it means so much more to me. For God so loved the world, now we understand the whole world and how God chooses to deal with it, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. There's this belief going around that theologians call the dual covenant theology or theory. The dual covenant theology or theory teaches that Jewish people have the Torah and the Old Testament covenants with God and are saved based on that. That is their relationship to God. Whereas Jesus, Yeshua, is for the Gentiles. That is their covenant with God. And so Christians who believe that think it's unnecessary and even counterproductive to tell Jewish people about Jesus. Can you imagine being a Christian person and thinking it's counterproductive to share Yeshua with Jewish people? If Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, is not for the Jewish people, who's he for? You'd be ashamed and surprised at some of the people that teach this. I'm real tempted to share the name, but I'm just going to refrain for now. If you want to know, come see me later. One more thing I want to point out to you, and then I'll be done. I sent this in the email last night. Uh, there's a handful of Bible verses that people like to rest upon to prove that God is done with the Jewish people. I think we just put that to rest. But one of them is in Acts, and it's in the last chapter of Acts. Paul is sharing the message with some Jewish people, same pattern as you saw, and when they reject him, he basically says, it be on your own head, I'm going to the Gentiles. And that's one of the last verses of the book of Acts. So some unlearned people say, see, this is, this is how it works. Paul brought the gospel to the Jewish people, the Jewish people rejected it. Paul said, I'm done with you, I'm going to the Gentiles. The problem is, that happened in every city he went to. <laughs> he went to a city, he shared the message. Some Jewish people accepted it, some rejected it. When they got violent and kicked him out, he said, I'm done with you, I'm going to the Gentiles. And he did, until he hit the next town. And then he'd go back to the synagogue, share the message with the Jewish people. Some would accept it, some would reject it. When they kicked him out of town, he'd go, first he'd share with the Gentiles and say, I'm going to the Gentiles, I'm out of here. Town after town after town. So that we see it again in the last chapter of the book of Acts is not some new doctrine. It's the same doctrine repeated over and over. I don't know if I pointed this out to you. I need to do so, though. Let me see if I can find the verse real quick. In that passage in Acts, I think I might have emailed it to you last night. He said it was necessary that we bring the gospel to the Jew first. And I wanted you to emphasize that word necessary. He said it was necessary that we bring the message of Yeshua to you first. And now we go to the Gentiles. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. They use those passages in Acts as an excuse of saying the gospel is no longer supposed to go to the Jew. And dual covenant theology bears that out when the exact opposite is the teaching of Scripture. To the Jew first, it's necessary, and then to the Greek. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, help us not to be ashamed of the good news of Yeshua, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. In that message is the righteousness of God. And I pray that you would give us the glorious opportunity to share our faith with many people, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for it's in Yeshua's name that we pray. Amen.
Can you stand with me, please?
So go out this week and let your shine, your light shine. Let people see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Proclaim the name of Messiah. Lift him up to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Please bow your heads for the ironic benediction. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'chunecha Yis Adonai panavalecha v'yoseim lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. So if you're new with us, please exit through the lobby there, cross the courtyard to room number three. It's our bistro. Some of the leadership will be there to greet you. We have a gift for you. The rest of you, come over and fellowship if you want. God bless you. See you Wednesday night. Shabbat shalom.